if you had to pick one month and one month alone to listen to nothing but Mariah Carey 24-7, every minute on repeat, and it can't be December, what month would you pick? November. Why? Because I'm already doing it. So if you made a list of gifts as an adult, how would it differ from the gifts you wanted as a child? You know, I guess as a as a kid, I always wanted, you know, fun toys and not clothing, you know, just just mm-hmm. stuff that really didn't serve a purpose other than yeah, than joy. I mean, I'm asking for space heaters now and uh thick socks, uh new pairs of underwear. Okay, yeah. no, nah, that that's that's very personal to me. Oh. If you made a list of gifts as an adult, how would it differ from the gifts you wanted as a child? Okay, it would be, my gifts as an adult would be I would want to give away something, but as a child I would want the gifts. Mm. And that goes with age. You see life differently and everything changes. If you made a list of gifts as an adult, how would it differ from the gifts you wanted as a child? Oh man. Okay, honestly, uh, man, child Nick would be so ashamed of the things I want now. Okay. Like, like a new lame. appliance? It's lame. You want a new refrigerator? It's practical. It's, yeah. yeah. I Okay, yes. I'd still be like some like drums or like some music okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that's cool. But other than that, it's like like an edger for my lawn, something like that. Really lame. Yeah. He's like, I'm a grass dad. New yeah, balances. It's, Yeah. Do you ever make a plan and then that whole list changes and how does that affect you? Oh, I always make plans and they always yeah. change. It doesn't have to be Christmas anytime. I think you set something as a plan, but then something comes up and it's priorities. Mm. So you prioritize. So like my grandkids would overtake another party somewhere. I okay. would go see them before I'd go to the party. Yeah. But I didn't know that they had that event. So okay. you just... You just have to kind of go with it. Your heart feels, gut feels, whatever. Okay. You. Awesome. Do you mind if I take a quick minute for a uh, minute for a sponsor? I don't care. Okay, cool. The Holy Bible. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good? good. I can see you. I see you. How are everybody's ready for Christmas? Yes? yes. We're starting to sing a couple Christmas songs in the church. Hope that's okay with you guys. Hope that's okay with you guys over here, at least. <laughs> Christmas songs are always weird in church because, like, um, not a lot of them are real worship songs. They're just like traditional songs. And so we sing them because it speaks to the tradition that we're in, to the memories that we have, but it doesn't really laud Jesus much. And it's really hard to find Christmas songs that speak to um, Jesus' kingship. And because uh, that's the promise that Gabriel makes to, um, to Mary. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, that the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says something unique to her. And he, he uses that language of a king that your son is going to be the king, ruling from the, the throne of David, which meant something to them, doesn't necessarily need to mean anything to us right now, but it meant something to them. And then he says, and his, his reign will never end. And I was worshiping backstage um, through the Christmas songs and through everything. Um, and this isn't my message. I'm going to start that in a moment. And I was just overcome with this reality that I thought I would share with you. And I, I don't... I don't need to convince you of this. I want to just declare this as truth in the room and hope it resonates in your heart. And if it doesn't resonate in your heart, I'm asking that the Lord would allow it to work its way into the deep parts of your life because this truth will change you. It's the only truth that I know can change you. That Jesus is the king. He is the king. He is the king. There, there isn't an election that will um, unseat him. 
A, a government can't mandate different laws that work outside of his kingdom. His kingdom is established and it is um, on the earth now and it's being advanced through the work of Christians and through the church and the work that the church does. But he is a king and he's not a king that rules with a heavy hand and a, and, a, and a mean disposition that he is in fact a good king that leads his people into good things and, and yet it still demands of us, requires of us a submission and a surrender to him. In the Old Testament, you can read stories of kings where they would have their throne room and people weren't allowed to enter the throne room unless they were invited, lest they lose their lives. That kings demand authority. They demand submission to others. And yet God, through his son Jesus, who's established his kingdom, invites us with open arms. He is the king. He is the king, and we celebrate his birth this Christmas season. So praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. I don't have to convince you. It's all good. I believe it to be true, and the Bible tells us so, so it's all good. So let's get started. Almost everyone here today would admit this, that um, we struggle with getting stuff done, especially at Christmas time, I suspect. I've already asked somebody, you got all your Christmas shopping done yet? <laughs> I haven't started, for the record. And... Um, and we do, we all struggle with getting stuff done. And some of us even struggle with the stage that's right before that, just figuring out specifically what we have to do or what we need to do. And so we make these things, these, these um, helpful tools called to-do lists, and they become the answer to the problem for us. And this, this time-honored system of to-do lists where we just make simple and succinct lists that aids our lives by showing us the tasks that need to be accomplished. And we get to cross them off one by one. How, how great does that feel? Like when you cross it off one by one. The psychologist and author David Cohen, Dr. David Cohen, believes that his personal struggle to stay organized is helped by um, making lists. He goes, I agree, it's not entirely solved by making lists, but it certainly helps me when I write things down and I pay attention to them. You can't just write it down and forget about it, but you have to constantly monitor the list that you've made. And so whether we do so in an app on our phone, I use a list app on my phone or a notes app on my phone, or you do it on a piece of paper, postcard, whatever, um, it's hel it helps us to be productive. And Cohen states there's a reason why we love to-do lists, and it can be found in three reasons, and I'll give them to you here. Number one, it helps diminish our anxiety. In an already chaotic life, when we make a list, it helps to diminish some of our anxiety. Secondly, it provides some structure to us, gives us a simple plan of attack, and we need some structure sometimes in our lives. And my favorite is the last thing, which is it gives us a sense of achievement. As I already mentioned, when you cross off the list or you put the check mark next to it, you feel accomplished for the day or for the week or for the month or whatever list, you know, um, constraint you put on there. But more recently, and this is fascinating, a study by professors Bomeister and Maisie Campo from Wake Forest University says this, that while, we, while tasks we haven't done distract us, right? They just, just making a plan to get them done can free us from anxiety. In short, they say this. They posit that once we commit to a specific plan of action, we tend to think less about that task. So once you write it down, once you commit it to a piece of paper or to the app in your phone, you don't have to remember it anymore. This thing does it for you. And it, it, it sort of takes away the stress for you. Um, the Zygarnik effect it means this, that undone tasks are always looming in our heads and they make us anxious. How many people are anxious, right? Lists can help with this. I'm an anxious person by nature. And so lists help me. So when we make a to-do list, a plan to complete some tasks, we're helping ourselves in a couple ways. First, we ease the stress and the anxiety of our lives because we no longer have to remember this important thing that has to get done. And that's so helpful. We can free up our mind for other things. And secondly, it actually forces us to figure out a solution to the problem that's before us. So when you sit down to make a list, you actually have to think about what has to happen. If you're going to, I don't write a book, bake a cake, whatever it is, and you put it down in steps, you know the first thing you have to do. To just simply say, I want to write a book in 2024 is a daunting one item list. But if you break that down into six or seven different smaller 
items. Like I just need to outline chapter one or outline the characters or, or do, you see what I'm saying? And so when we do that, we're formulating a solution to the problem that we have and we have this roadmap to completion, and that's really what we want. That is, of course, if the plan that we've created is at all feasible to us. So as a pastor, um, I've been the fly on the wall to many weddings, dozens upon dozens of weddings, and I've met with a lot of different couple, couples for premarital counseling, which is always fun. The, the groom to me always looks like a deer in the headlights, just telling you. <laughs> Like, I'm just here because she wants me here. I just, I don't know what's happening sometimes. And I get that. And I can say this with 100% certainty that every couple I've met with before a wedding, they have a plan in place. Yes? They have talked about their futures together. They wondered what it looked like if they were to get married. They've talked about children. Are we going to have kids or not have kids? If the Lord blesses us with the kids, we want one kid or five, five kids. They've talked about living in the city or out in the country, whether they have pets. And th by pets, I mean dogs. I don't know what's going on with this cat garbage. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> Anyways, whether or not to have a, a dog or so. And then I even encourage them to talk about the temperature setting that they expect on the thermostat once they move in together. You don't want to be blindsided by this, young man. You need to know where you're headed. But all that to say, most of their lives are planned, you know, as best they can. In fact, this is one of the primary reasons when I was a young pastor, a young minister, just starting to perform weddings, I used to get so anxious before weddings as the wedding day approached, I oftentimes felt I was more anxious than the bride or the groom. And everyone knows that brides have been thinking about their wedding days since they were little girls. And in their mind, their wedding day is perfect. They marry the perfect person, we hope so. The ceremony should be perfect, the weather should be perfect. All the family gets, uh, gets along with one another, yes, even that crazy uncle. But in reality, there's always something that fractures the facade of their perfect wedding. One of the groomsmen is late to arrive, as per usual, right? Or the flowers were delivered to the wrong church. And my favorite is when the groom suit doesn't fit on the day of the wedding because he didn't think it necessary to try it on before the big day. Real story, real story. <laughs> and for me, I was always overcome with anxiety because I thought I would be the one that would screw it up. Like, I would be the reason that they talk about the wedding 20 years from now. Remember that ridiculous pastor who forgot to tell us to exchange rings? I've never done that, by the way. I have done this. I've almost finished a wedding and realized I never asked or invited everybody else to have a seat. You know how they all stand when the, when the bride comes marching in? And they all stand in reverence. And I'm like, well done. And I just went into the wedding. And I was at the ring portion when I said, oh, my gosh, you guys can have a seat. Yeah, I actually called the bride the wrong name once. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> you, you, typically, the bride and the groom are really not paying attention to my words. Like, I could be saying anything. They're just staring into each other's eyes with love. It's gross. And it's like this whole thing. I love you. I, no, I love you more. I love you. I love you more. It's this thing. But when you call the bride the wrong name, bam, she is back at reality. <laughs> she, she is unhappy with you. So, I, so I've been told. So, but planning is important. And even more so in regards to weddings, we would say. They've picked their close friends and invited them to take some time off from work for the wedding rehearsal the day before to stand with them as a bridesmaid or a groomsman. They've chosen the flowers and the color scheme and they pick a dress and that's a whole thing. And... The guys have to choose whether to wear ties or suspenders. And for the reception, they've picked a DJ to play the dancing music, and they've picked a caterer to play the feasting, or, or to, to, to cater the feast, sorry. Nothing goes unplanned except for the weather. See, most couples prefer the day's weather to be calm and sunny and comfortable. If it rains, it's considered to be bad luck. I don't know if that's true or not. Rained on my wedding day, I think, 27 years later. Take that, <laughs> right? But every now and then, a couple will make a plan for their wedding, and they'll plan it outside, and they have no control over the weather. And they plan ahead, and they set up tents, keep their guests dry just in case of inclement weather. 
and they sometimes have a backup venue just in case we've used the church here as a backup venue for another for a wedding one time that was outside in case it rained can we come to the church of course but some things like the weather are just outside of our, our control and when I was writing this, I was thinking of two particular weddings of people that some of you might know from the church here. I won't mention their names, but they both had um, outdoor weddings. Uh, one of these weddings took place. There's a friend of mine. She was getting married on the exact same day that I was actually supposed to officiate my very first wedding. And I'm pointing at people here because they know who this was. And, but I had time because they were at different times in the day. I went to this friend's wedding and it was outdoor and it was in this meadow, this pasture. It was beautiful. It was summer. It was a little muggy. I got to say, I admit that. It was a little muggy. I'm so thankful that I wasn't officiating that wedding because it was sweaty, just sweaty. So after the wedding, it was beautiful, you know, hug the family, whatever. And I sneak off to go officiate my, my, my wedding later in the afternoon. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't hear this till the next day, but w when we left and after the wedding was done and they start the reception, a storm, one of those like summer storms just blew in. And, and a deluge just sort of sit into this ravine where, where there's like seven or eight inches of water and mud and the, the, the tables were almost floating away and the bride and the groom just went with it. They're like, whatever. And, and they're running around doing mud slides, just having a blast. <laughs> like most people would ruin their day, not for them. It was a lot of fun. But uh, this other wedding I'm thinking about, I didn't attend, but I heard stories of it only because some people at this wedding ended up in the hospital it was another outdoor wedding here in town or local and a big storm blew in and it came in like with tornadic winds, like just big winds. And they're holding down the tent poles and stuff and the wind just ripping them up. People were hit in the head with these tent poles, concussed some of them going to the hospital for stitches. Like you talk about a story from your wedding. But I, I mentioned these examples, weddings just as one of the many examples that we could use to describe what the writer of Proverbs says. Look at Proverbs 16, nine. He says this, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. This is just a simple way of saying that plans sometimes change. It's not a bad thing. Sometimes it's for the better, especially when God is in fact directing our steps. So I just want us to understand this. We should be people who make plans, but understand that they must be held in humility before God and in surrender of his ultimate will. One Bible commentator said this, this is true with both good and bad plans, that the point is the contrast between what we actually plan and what actually happens. And he, he says this, God determines that. It's, it's not coincidence, it's not chance, there is a being, we call him God, the creator of everything, and he's the one who takes care of that piece between what we plan and what actually happens, it goes through him. Another commentator says this, as rational agents, we think, we consult, and we act freely. We are dependent agents, and the Lord exercises his own power in permitting and overruling and furthering our actions. And he closes with this, thus man proposes and God disposes. Isn't that great? And all of this just points to a reality that we have all experienced firsthand. And it's, it's challenging for us. Plans change. And yet we all admit we bristle when our spouse calls or texts and says, hey, I know we're supposed to eat with the Joneses, but plans have changed. Or the doctor's office calls and says, hey, I know we weren't gonna like do surgery for this, but we just got your test results back and plans have changed. We have to do something else. A side note, as an introvert, um, my love language is canceled plans, just for the record. <laughs> like sometimes I just plan things to only cancel them so that I can love myself a little better. <laughs> my favorite thing is when Stacy, my wife says, hey, we were supposed to go out with so-and-so tonight, but they called and can't make it. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You love me, you really, really love me. <laughs> the change, laugh it up as much as we want, it's, it's really just a, a common aspect of our lives. In fact, I would say change is one of the ways we know that we are in fact alive. Living things change. They grow, they age, they breathe, they flower, they move. Changing is a reality of living. And here at Renaissance, we actually use that idea as one of our core values. We say growing people change. And it reminds us to not be too hard on ourselves and or others, because through this new life that we have in Jesus Christ, 
We are always growing and we are always changing. Say amen. amen. Yes. Growing things change. Growing people change. But change is not without its problems. Change is oftentimes accompanied by anxiety and fear. And since our to-do lists and planning somehow ease our anxiety, it would make perfect sense that when our plans crumble, our anxiety comes knocking back at the door like a vengeance. But anxiety, I've learned, is oftentimes rooted in fear. And sometimes it's just fear of losing control of a situation. Let's admit it. It's not just a change of plans that causes discomfort. It's whenever someone else changes your plans, it becomes a problem. Does that make sense? It's not just that plans change, that's the problem, but it's when someone else changes the plans for you. It's the old adage that says this, a cat may go in a box on its own accord, but you cannot put that cat in the box. It wants some autonomy, it wants to make its own choice. So if I make the change into plans, that's fine, but I hate it when someone else changes them for me. But let me ask you this, what if the person that changes your plans is in fact God? Does that make a difference? <laughs> I think it should. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah says this about God. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This is Isaiah speaking on God's behalf. God simply sees things differently than we do. And his ability to choose rightly is better than us. Nothing God does is ever wrong. You agree? Ever is it wrong. And because he is always good, every decision he makes is good. Even when he decides to interrupt our plans, <laughs> there's no better example found in all of scripture than in the story of a young girl named Mary and her betrothed boyfriend, husband, fiance, to be whatever, Joseph, when she has to give birth to the baby Jesus, and which seems appropriate to talk about that at this time of year. So the story of Mary and Joseph begins, some of you may know this already, but it begins with an angel named Gabriel. This angel, this, this spiritual being, um, angel, just for the record, well, just so you know, the word angel actually means messenger. And so, um, angel, a messenger from heaven, leaves he the heavenly realm, and he, he comes, it comes, he, I don't know, it, but it comes down to heaven to this little bitty village where there's a, a young girl named Mary, and Mary's in this place, and this, this angel, Mary, or Gabriel, comes to Mary and, and tells her something. I want to remember that Mary at this time, she's uh, engaged to a man named Joseph. They're in the, the planning stage of their wedding. They've got their future life all picked out and they're ready to go. And then Gabriel announces a change in their plans. Luke tells us um, that Mary was in fact afraid. Look here in Luke chapter one, verse 30. It says that when the angel came to her, he had to first tell her to not be afraid because you have found favor with God. Now, in their world, as in our world, angel experiences were not like happening all the time. It's not like running into a Starbucks in Seattle or a Dunkin' Donuts out east. Like they're all over the place out there. Um, they were quite rare and didn't happen often. And so when this angel or messenger comes to Mary, she certainly was afraid. But the angel reminds her, like, before I say what I'm about to say to you, you need to calm down, young lady. <laughs> You need to settle yourself because I need you to hear what I'm going to say. And, and he says, you have found favor with God. In the Old Testament, we oftentimes read how, well, God will look to and fro, the Bible tells us, to find those people whose hearts are inclined towards him. Those that seek to please God rather than others. Those who are humble and have a contrite spirit, the Bible says. And they receive God's favor. Luke, in saying those words, helps us see the humility in this young woman named Mary. And Mary must have expressed this humility, this contrite heart before God before, because God sees it. Gabriel states that Mary has God's favor. In verse 31, then he continues, and he says, and behold, you are going to conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. 
And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over this house of Jacob or over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end, right? So we talked about that a little bit before. But can we just see it from the outset, from like, you know, 30,000 feet? This is a major change of plans for Mary. Would you agree? Yes, major. We don't know exactly when their wedding was supposed to take place, all indications that it was going to be soon. But God had said Mary is going to do something else now, or both. But she's going to have her wedding, but she's going to be pregnant when she does it. And I'm sure that's not what they planned. It's a long story. But you can just imagine this change of plans was, was causing some discomfort and anxiety in her and in her husband, Joseph. Don't even get me started with how Joseph probably felt. Should they wait until after the wedding to get married? I mean, sorry, until after the baby is born to go ahead with the wedding? Is there even going to be a wedding at this place? Maybe Joseph won't even believe the story about this miraculous conception and break off the engagement with Mary. And what are their plans for this simple life together? Gabriel says that the son that she's going to give birth to is the son of God. <laughs> I don't care. You just want a, like a meager existence out into the, the hills of Galilee. Just want to work a small job, maybe at the 7-Eleven. I don't know, right? And ride my bike to, to back and forth to church. Something real simple, write books and press paper and make my own bread. Like that's a simple life you want, right? And then, and then Gabriel comes and says, oh, by the way, the baby you're going to ha have is the son of God. <laughs> Your simple life just evaporated with those words. He is going to be a king with a kingdom that never ends. And their simple lives are all guaranteed to be lost in this change of plans. But the angel Gabriel then becomes silent in this moment, no longer declaring the oracles of God. And Mary takes a breath and asks this simple question. Look at her response, verse 34. It says, and Mary says to the angel, well, how will this be since I am a virgin? Whatever God has planned won't work, she thinks. For a baby to be conceived, it requires something of her that she does not have. And this change of plans in Mary's life is not only a disruption, but it's an impossibility. How on earth is this going to happen? What is God thinking? Let me pause here. Let me read that. The change that God places in Mary's life is an impossibility for her. The, the plans that God sometimes changes for you are in fact an impossibility for you. That you cannot do the very thing that God is saying he's going to do without him. You see this, that there's something that happens next, and we'll get to it in a moment, that, that actually ushers in this change in her life. God speaks it, tells her this is what I want for you, but it actually can't happen unless God does something with her. And that comes on the heels of what happens next. To be clear, the how of the plan is actually not the issue. How is God going to do this? doesn't matter. God spoke and there was light. He created everything out of nothing, what theologians call in the Latin ex nihilo. It just means out of nothing, God created everything. So he can certainly do whatever this angel is saying he's going to do. What is truly at heart here is whether or not Mary will allow God to change her plans. What really is at stake in your life and in mine is not how God could do it, it's whether or not we're going to let him do it in our lives. Will she set aside everything that she desires? Will she allow God to change her plans? Will she set aside everything that she has thought about since she was a little girl? Will she let God change everything in this moment? Now, Gabriel, in the next sentence here, he confirms that the Holy Spirit's gonna take care of the how. Look at verse 35. It says, the angel answers Mary's question. How can this be, since I'm a virgin? Well, the angel says, the Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you. The power of God himself, the Most High, he's gonna overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And then, and then Gabriel actually, actually gives Mary some encouragement here. He tells her that God has done a miracle similar to this, not the exact same thing, but he's done a miracle um, with... Um, 
with a, a, ne- a relative of Mary's. He says, verse 36, and behold, he says, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her. It just means this, she's got a belly at this point. Right? When you're pregnant in six months, you have a, a little belly. And she's like, as a way of encouragement, he's almost inviting Mary to go see it. If you need a little proof on how this is gonna happen, this is how it can happen. And so that, that final line of what he says in verse 37, that nothing will be impossible for God, that line, listen to me, must become a mantra for our lives as believers. That nothing will be impossible for God. If I could give you, if I could give you a line to carry home with you today, it would be that, that nothing is impossible with God for you. If your circumstances seem impossible, just remember they are, if not for God. (laughs) If you believe nothing can fix your situation, that you're not thinking correctly about who God is. If you allow your mind to go to that place, you just put the works of God on a shelf and and shut the the door. And you're not walking around with a faith that's ever present in your life. I say that not to beat anyone up. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, no. I want this to be an encouragement to you. Like when things feel most dark and most impossible and like I, I just don't know how I'm going to get through the next day, um, it's possible the Lord would have us lean into the work that he can do and, and the plans that he can orchestrate to change things instead of trying to orchestrate our own way out. All of us have been in that place where we've made plans and we've done all the things. And right before we sign the papers on the house or the car or do the thing or move to change jobs, and then we just, we ask God to bless it after we've already made the decisions. Yes? Yes? Yes, 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 yes. And what, what we're learning here is that sometimes we can allow God into that process before we can allow him to be a part of the plans that he makes. So we must never be people who feel hopeless because God is our ever-present hope. Say amen. Amen. And when he comes to us and says, I want to change the plans that you have for your life, he's saying my plans are better than yours. We need to respond like Mary. Look what Mary says in verse 38. Mary says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. I remember seeing this almost like with fresh eyes. I've heard this story as have many of you many times, but I never once caught it for what it is. Gabriel's inviting her into the plans that God wants to change for her. He was not forcing her. He could. He has every right to. The invitation for the miracle, the invitation for a, a miraculous virginial, is that Virginia? I don't know, Virgi- uh, <laughs> I'll make up my own words here at the church. Um, but this miraculous birth of a young virgin conceiving, all of that, <laughs> hear me, all of the miraculous hinges upon the willingness of her to say, yes, Lord, do it. Yes, Lord, do it. I will admit this, it's not only how God works in our lives, but sometimes the disconnect is not what he can do, it's what you'll allow him to do. That's the disconnect. Mary, God wants to change your plans. God wants to change your life. This amazing thing's gonna happen. And he explains it, he gives her a little proof, whatever, go check it out. And then she says, okay, whatever you want to do. Luke then tells us that Mary took Gabriel's advice, went to see her cousin Elizabeth to confirm that it was indeed God who was making these claims. And I don't think God is offended if we want to test the waters, so to speak. But at some point she figures it out. This is what the Lord is doing. Verse 39, it says, in those days, Mary goes, she goes with haste to the hill country, to a town of Judah, and she enters the house of Zechariah and she's greeted by her cousin Elizabeth. And I want to say this. We might argue that sometimes um, that's easy to hear God 
in this instance because an angel was sent to her. Like if, if all of us had an angel sent to us, we'd go, well, I believe that, right? Maybe, I doubt it, honestly. <laughs> you chalk it up to bad milk or mac and cheese or too many beers at the bar. I don't know what you chalk it up to, but you, we'd find some way to discount it. We actually need to be able to hear God. I wish God would send more angels speaking to his people. <laughs> I know he speaks to us through his word, the Bible. Any Bible readers here? He speaks to us in prayer. How many people pray and hear the voice of the Lord in their prayer? I was talking about this with my staff this week. We were actually asking one another whether or not we've actually heard the audible voice of God. And I have not heard the audible voice of God. I think so. There was a time um, I was sleeping and I heard someone come into my room and say, Jeff, and I sat up and said, yep, and nobody was there. That's strange, right? You can say it's strange, I don't care. Like, you're a weirdo, Jeff, I, yes, yes. Was that, the, I don't know, I don't know what that was. But I do know sometimes when I'm praying, I'm seeking God's will, I'm asking him what I should do next, or just in prayer, uh, reading my, the Bible, that God will lay something inside of my heart that didn't come from me, or he'll place like a thought in my mind that didn't originate from me. And so I just chalk it up to, the, it's the Lord, the Lord is speaking, okay? Can we just agree that God still speaks today? Yeah, we, we would be sunk if, we, if he didn't still speak to us. Yes, he still speaks to us today. But sometimes it doesn't get over the din of the noise of our lives. And we don't hear him. So I'm trying to finish up. I only have a few minutes left, but um, uh, I have a condition called tinnitus or tinnitus. Anybody know what tinnitus or tinnitus is? How many people have it? Where are my ear ringing people, <laughs> right? It's a ringing in the ear. And I, I've played in bands since I was 14 years old. I'm partially deaf. It's kind of awesome, honestly. <laughs> Especially when my family's like, hey, can you take out the trash? I'm like, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I uh, use and abuse it, I promise you. Um, but there is a constant ringing in my ears. Constant ringing in my ears. It's a bit unnerving. I don't notice it most days until I go to bed and shut everything off and I'm sitting in a quiet room. And then it goes, zing, I just hear this the buzz. Oh, it's crazy. And audiologists can actually measure the decibel or the perceived loudness of that in your ear. They can match that pitch and they could play a tone in the room and they start it really quiet, really low. And when it gets to a decibel that you can actually hear and you raise your hand, they can stop and they go, oh, you have about an, a, a 65 decibel ring in your ear, which I don't know if you know this, that's loud. And I say all that to say this, that there's sometimes just a ringing in our ears of just the, the, the noise of life, the stresses of life, the concerns of life. And every once in a while, God's voice is way down here. And we don't hear it because everything else is running um, full speed until we go home, right? We shut off everything and all of a sudden we can hear this. I'm a pastor of a church and I'm convinced God speaks to his people more than you would agree that he speaks. Many of you, I love you, come to me wondering what God is saying to you. <laughs> I will pray with you and I will, I will help you, right? I can't always discern that for you, but I do know this, that God is good that he speaks to his people and that you might very well just have to posture yourself to hear him. You might just have to quiet yourself. What does that look like for you? Therein lies the rub. I could give you some things. I, I'll be honest with you, I think some people in the room are probably with people they shouldn't be with. Like you have a desire to chase after the Lord and the person you're with, not so much, right? And they're, all they're talking is sometimes just distracting you from what God is trying to tell you. I don't, I don't know who these people are. I just say this, and there might be no one in here, but I think that to be true. 
Some of you, some of us in the room are so convinced that God is not a provider that you must work two and sometimes three jobs that you busy yourself so much that you don't have time to pray. That you don't have time to read the Bible and to hear the Lord. M many times, not even enough time to come to church where I will read it, chew it up, and spit it into your mouth for you. That's a gross image. <laughs> and, and for the record, I, I like it about as much as you do. We asked the question in the video, how have your Christmas lists matured, right, as you get older? And uh, you have a different perspective on the things you would ask for. I think the, the more we walk with the Lord and understand him, the more we mature, we ask for different things from him as well. We mature. And the same can be true when we make our plans. We can, we can mature into the plans that God has for us. We can come up with wild plans. And I'm telling you, God is a wild God. He, will, he does some wild stuff on the earth for sure, for sure, for sure. But we can allow God to join us in those plans. So I have five things I'm done. I'm gonna give these to walk out. We're finishing up right here, okay? Let us stay flexible with life's surprises. I'm not saying every change of plans is from God, but sometimes they are, and we should at least stay flexible and to try to understand that this is God possibly um, changing something for us. Life is full of surprises. We should embrace the flexibility, yes? Number two, include prayer in your plans. When you're making your to-do lists, make your to-do lists, pray. God, is this where you want me to go? It's not hard. And I apologize for the young people, the young people in the Lord here that don't really understand prayer. Like we should do a better job of teaching. I know that. But let me just say this. It's not hard. Talk to God like you would talk to your neighbor or your spouse or your best friend. Say, Lord, I'm asking. And make your plans and just trust God and his power and divide in providence to break in and help you. Yes, okay. And trust God's um, perfect timing. Much like Gandalf, he always arrives just on time. Anyone? Lord of the Rings, okay. A wizard is never early, Frodo Baggins, nor is he late. He always arrives precisely on time. Anyways, all right. <laughs> I'm nerding out. All right, I'm almost done. I would get done sooner if you would stop interrupting me. I'm just telling you, <laughs> I blame you. I blame you. Listen for God's guidance. Actively listen. Through prayer, through reading scripture, through insights from others. I have had people speak to me, running up to me in the gallery out here, Jeff, and they say something and I'm like, that's from the Lord. That's from the Lord. Lastly, let go of fear and embrace the peace. Embrace the king of kings, the prince of peace. When our plans change, embrace him. He is there with us. We can find ways to release fear and anxiety and remember always that God's plans for you are good, always. Always. Trust his guidance. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together, we come before you now with open hearts. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your leading. We thank you for the wisdom that you've shared with us today. Lord, we just ask that you would help us to apply some of these things to our lives. Sometimes it's not the fact that we don't hear you, Lord, but we just don't know what to do next. So God, would you help us in what's next? Help us to be flexible and to have strength in you when plans change. Help us to bring prayer into our planning. Help us to seek your guidance to align our steps with your purpose. God, instill inside of us a confidence and trust in your perfect timing. And God, let us hear your voice amidst the, the noise of our lives. We want to hear you speak. Lord, help us to echo Mary's words when she says, Behold, 
I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me. Let us follow the prompting of God. Heavenly Father, I pray you bless each person that's gathered here today. Give us courage to follow your plans, even when they differ from our own. And may your presence go before us every step of the way. And may you form Renaissance, the people here to be a church, to be a people who live in faith and in hope and in love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.